go through there to find the I think I figured out how to live stream. Would you live stream it? Potentially. Oh my god. <laughs> I, if I knew that, I would have told Andrew Scarpelli to watch it. Yeah, that's the plan. Although, we'll see how well it works because currently it's not actually showing video. Yeah. So we'll see. And so their alternative is like, oh, no, they just like freak. Well, it turns out normal undergrads, when you shout no at them, they yeah, do this with their hands. <laughs> and that, their Westerns work. You don't have when you teach the highest school. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're fine. No, these are normal bio majors. Okay. It's the highest children are hilarious. Also, like, their Western apparatus is murky. So we like unplugged it, took the buffer out, plugged it, plugged it back in. Oh, like 40 minutes later, they're like, should I have a restroom you now? Like, I have no yeah, they go, really? Because they're not like one like half hour. But if you wait a minute, like, they're sitting there watching. Just so stack them in a pizza sandwich. <laughs> yeah, you know, make do. Make we can rip off the top. Taking all of the pizza. That's not all for me. Yeah. I know, I caught that last week. I had to do that last week. And I wrote six pages of answers to your questions. Yes. Like, so I mean, actually work. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Are these special pizzas? Um, no, they're just regular pizzas. Yeah. Do you know what mic is here? Oh, wait, do you know what mic looks like? I never met him. Alright, I guess we're waiting for the last one. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Also, do we know who's left up recently? It's the Pope Western. Western. Okay. Might, is he at, he might, he's not at LR4, is he? Uh, I don't know. It's so weirdly, it's like different. Yes. Yeah. Like, so quiet. Like, I guess that goes another one. Well, like, nobody else makes a chance because we're probably. Like, we don't even know. We're in Chicago. Yeah, it's like, we want to say that. So, pretty over reading. Joey, do you got a second pet? Yeah. Uh, but I, 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 I,
can explain what that's about. Everybody get the sign sheet. Does anyone need the sign sheet? Yeah, I can. It was good. Wow, it's exciting. <laughs> Hope you don't have a lot of green in your presentation. <laughs> Synthetic biology with experimental evolution. And then uh, Jordan's going to uh, give a talk on DUI bio. Uh, but first, we'll talk a little bit about uh, SynBio news um, as soon as this comes up. Uh, we had, for our March meeting, we had a great recap of the EBRC conference. Um, so some of the news is going to be from the March meeting, and then some of it's going to be from, or from March, and some of it's from April. Um, so actually, a lot to cover, but uh, cool. Nice. So you, you could like start talking about the news and I'll try to cool. Yeah, try to I mean we're really just trying to get that open. Alright. So basically uh, we'll start off with well do we have any announcements for Gmod we do that too? Um well uh, we've got some exciting stuff coming up. We're in com we're in conversation with um, the local uh, Head of the FBI chapter on biosecurity, and he should be coming and giving a talk sometime in like July or August. Um, yeah, um, and then we have, uh, we will continue through the summer, uh, just to let you guys know. Um, so we have plans for uh, June, July, and August. Cool. It's gonna, it's gonna work, guys. <laughs> Hey. Cool. It's nice and it's fine. All right. Cool. Uh, so just starting off. Uh, so we'll do a quick recap of some SynBio industry stuff. So the company called eGenesis, which actually spun out of uh, George Church's lab, uh, and raised thirty-eight uh, million dollars for basically uh, genetically engineering pigs for uh, xenograft uh, transplantation. So there's like some things about pigs that would make them not. Good candidates all the time uh, that would be commonly rejected uh, by humans, but they're going to take out all of those by like massively multiplex CRISPR. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and Jennifer Dabna is smiling in the corner because the European Patent Office uh, decided to grant uh, University of California a broad patent on CRISPR Cas9. So now we have sort of different definitions from the EU versus the United States as to who would own uh, CRISPR. And I'm not as much an expert as like Albert or something like that, but uh, what I have, uh, what I got from this is basically it's a single patent for single guide RNA uh, 
editing in across all cells. So that's pretty huge. Um, so we'll see how that plays out. Uh, other things going on uh, in the uh, symbiote industry. So there's a couple startups, uh, Venomix and uh, Venomab. Uh, which are basically using bacteria, in the case of Venomix, and uh, actually mammalian cells for Venomab, to make antibodies against uh, venoms. Uh, and so basically the idea there is you could uh, produce them much more cheaply with a lot more stable supply uh, than previously available, although for this, as, along with a lot of other uh, third world problems, really the issue is uh, distribution rather than actual cost of manufacturing, so we'll see how that works out. Uh, in other news, uh, Twist raises another $33 million, so they're up to like $200 million now. And so Twist Bioscience, the DNA synthesis company, continues to go strong and basically continues to raise funds despite the fact that their technology is owned by Edwin, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, uh, I think the plan there is just like get enough equity so that whatever they cost you, it's fine. It's like we'll just settle. Um, but anyway, so uh, in other news, very sad, uh, sort of the uh, patron saint or like uh, mascot of Symbio, the glowing plant uh, is, has met its demise. Uh, they're no longer developing glowing plant. Instead, they're focusing on fragrant moss. So uh, go for that Kickstarter instead. Uh, in, the, in the actual research papers, uh, there's some cool work on bacteriophage antibiotics. So we actually haven't known about this for a while, but people are getting a little more serious about it now. There's a scientific reports paper about basically isolating naturally occurring bacteriophages and using them to treat like a wide variety of uh, like resistant, uh, normal antibiotic resistant uh, E. coli, uh, which is cool. But if they would have put CRISPR in it, they would have got a Nature Biotechnology paper, <laughs> as we see here, <laughs> um, where basically uh, this team was able to exploit CRISPR Cas9 delivered by bacteriophages to make the cell kill itself. But posing the question, if bacteriophages already kill bacteria, why do you have to program them to kill bacteria even more? Um, <laughs> but there, there are some cool functionalities of like targeting systems, and, and it could be more effective than just your standard bacteriophage. But anyway, interesting. Um, in other news, we have uh, CRISPR and gene drives coming in strong. So uh, speaking of CRISPR, so nucleic acid detection, there's a really cool paper out of uh, Frank Drugs Lab uh, and James Collins, uh, which is named Sherlock. So specific high sensitivity enzymatic recorder unlocking. <laughs> they will do anything for an acronym. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so, but it is cool. So what it does is basically they're able to amplify uh, at room temperature these like RNA or DNA pieces. Uh, this is just one manifestation. They have several uh, of them. And basically there's this Cas13A, which like once it sees its guide RNA, it just like goes nuts and starts chopping all kinds of things. Um, and that's like collateral cleavage, as they call it. It's actually a method to get a fluorescence detection with like atomoles amount of input. So cool for like detecting viruses and such at uh, room temperature. Uh, Kevin Oswell had a paper uh, found on BioArchive by Isaac, uh, which is pretty cool. And basically it's making gene drives more like reversible and containable using like this daisy chain system. So basically you have like a a number of links in which the gene drive is effective, and by links I mean generations. And so basically what that would allow you to do is like it would only spread so far. Once you get past that generation, then it stops. Um, and so they talk about this, and they have these little like parachuting mice saying basically if you ran through your daisy chain and the whole population got edited, you'd be good, so that would be stable. But then you could drop in wild type again, like a whole lot of them, you could overcome uh, basically that, that editing, uh, but if you dropped in even like a suppressor, uh, people talked about that before using gene drives to buy gene drives, uh, you could again revert the entire population of that, which would be kind of cool. I thought the really crazy thing was they added this quorum sensing element, where basically like in any population where a majority has been edited, it'll go to like, to like all the population is edited, and in any population where like a minority has been edited, it'll go to completely wild type. Right, and yeah. So you get this defined population that's been changed. Yeah, so really cool trace. Um, Cool, so in cellular and molecular engineering, we had a few papers. Um, uh, Arnold's lab uh, came in with this, uh, these are descendants of the Arnold lab, uh, basically directed evolution of a near bright infrared fluorescent rhodopsin, and so basically what they can do is shift the uh, chromophore of this uh, protein to one that is near infrared, which is really desirable for imaging. Uh, there's other work in uh, this recent paper, this is Blade, Joe's not a big fan of this paper, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> there's definitely some, 
some shortcomings uh, for sure. But uh, it is kind of cool. It's it's a like your standard sort of like Chris Voigt tour de force of like we can uh, you know we can massively reprogram uh, cells. It's just this time the Romanian cells. So like that has really cool applications, and uh, you can get to some pretty interesting circuitries that way. Uh, another really cool application, this recently came out, like this correspondence, but basically they showed proof of concept for <laughs> detection of buried landmines using like bacteria sensors. So you like coat an area with landmines, or not with landmines. <laughs> 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 it already has landmines. <laughs> and then the bacteria will fluoresce uh, in different uh, colors to basically give you a normalized reading of whether or not there's a landmine there, which is like kind of cool. Um, it takes 24 hours, but that's okay. So, uh, building brains and genomes. Uh, there's a really cool paper on the assembly of like one of the more complex, as I understand. I'm not really a uh, neurobiologist, but uh, the one of the more complex uh, human forebrain like spirits. So basically, they can grow from like human stem cells these uh, really complex uh, brains, uh, and they like differentiate into different parts and everything, and that's really cool. And so it's kind of like a question. I wonder if these get really advanced, like. When do these things, you know, there's a really interesting biological thing about this. If you're growing brains in dishes, at what point are they brains and therefore, you know, like protected life? So, anyway, uh, it's kind of interesting. We're away from that, but at least begs the question. Uh, SC2.0, the effort to uh, synthesize a synthetic yeast genome, uh, is making a big leap. So, there were seven simultaneous papers in science. Uh, uh, Jeff Gokey was, was uh, leading the charge on that, sort of, uh, and that's really cool. So, you should check that out. Uh, policy and ethics, just a quick recap. Uh, there's some, uh, this will all be links uh, that are sent in our email, uh, but there's some really interesting articles on genetically modifying humans for interplanetary colonization. People are like really working on that. Uh, <laughs> the FDA uh, has approved 23 feet and supply a lot more information than they previously could. So now uh, they can tell you risk for various diseases, uh, which is uh, really a complete policy change versus what they had before. Uh, so good time to get your genome sequenced by 23 Me if you want more information. Uh, genetic editing by parents required. This is really interesting. It's an Atlantic article that compares CRISPR preventative treatment, so in other words, like treating uh, embryos so that they don't uh, have diseases, you know, uh, chronic diseases, uh, could be compared to like current uh, trials for medical neglect. So like if you don't give your kid antibiotics, you can be found guilty of like neglect. But if you don't give your kid, if you make it possible for your kid to get uh, muscular dystrophy, are you also neglecting them? Uh, so anyway, that's kind of like interesting. Uh, Bill Gates also had a really cool op-ed on uh, basically the unmet dangers of bioterrorism and proposes some fast forward, including like vaccine development and other things. So uh, that's it for the newsreel. Uh, we'll have Mike come up for his presentation. Thanks, guys. The Bill Gates one was funny because like, he's basically, it's, it's all the stuff he wants to do anyway with the vaccines, but now he's framed it from like global health to biosecurity with the change in administration. <laughs> Which is awesome. <laughs> all right. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk about uh, what I am the, the PhD lab, the lab that I did my PhD in, uh, called Synthetic Evolutionary Biology. It's a little buzzwordy, it might make some people cringe just gluing words together like that, but I actually mean something kind of specific by it. Uh, so let's get into that. So what do I mean by synthetic evolutionary biology? The way I would have you dissect that phrase is to kind of bracket evolutionary biology and stick synthetic on the front. So what it means is how can the tools of synthetic biology namely genetic engineering and construction of complex phenotypes and organisms, help us learn more about evolutionary biology. In what ways can synthetic biology help us learn things that we couldn't learn using naturally evolved organisms? Um, so this, I would, I would make this uh, sort of distinct from, you know, I mean, you might flip it around and say like evolutionary synthetic biology. Um, that would be using evolution to try to help synthetic biology with its goals. And that would be like, say, directed evolution, right? I would say directed evolution falls into that category. So I'm not going to talk about directed evolution today. I'm going to talk about how synthetic biology helps us understand more about how uh, the basic principles about how evolution works. Um, and there are a lot of I could cover on this, but I'm going to go over one paper each on these topics. So how uh, 
uh, evolutionary uh, synthetic biology and experimental evolution have helped uh, helped us understand uh, evolutionary innovation, biodiversity, symbiosis, the genetic code, and speciation. <clears throat> and don't think too hard about this this graphic. It's just the first thing that I found that seemed appropriate on the uh, on the topic. <laughs> So, so what, what is experimental evolution and why do it? So, so when I say experimental evolution, what I mean basically is taking organisms, um, potentially like domesticated organisms like, organisms like E. coli, out of their natural environment and creating simplified laboratory environments in which you evolve them and then, and then observe what traits or, or genotypes they, they come up with. Why would you want to do this? Well, the simple answer is that naturally evolved systems are really complex. So it's not always easy to isolate a single effect in an extremely complex ecosystem like a coral reef or whatever. Now, evolutionary biology has been around a lot longer than uh, synthetic biology or genetic engineering has, and so they've come up with a lot of uh, cool things, in, like, including like advanced statistical techniques to actually be able to isolate single effects uh, in very complex situations. But there are still things that maybe synthetic biology can help us with. So that's what laboratory evolution, uh, uh, sorry, experimental evolution basically offers us, the chance to construct a simple system in which you can study a very specific thing that you want to study. <clears throat> and uh, one of the most famous people in experimental evolution is my academic grandfather, uh, Dr. Richard Lenski. So he is a professor at Michigan State University. And Rich Lenski initiated in the 1980s what he termed the long-term evolution experiment. And so uh, it's been going since for about, I think about 30 years now. And basically what this was is he initiated uh, 12 clonal strains, uh, or sorry, 12, 12 clonal uh, lines of evolving E. coli. Uh, and, and the environment that the E. coli was evolving in was DM25 media. So a DM25, oh, I'm missing, oh, there it is. Um, DM25, DM25 media has uh, salts, first of all, and then also 139 micromolar glucose which is the, uh, the carbon source of the E. coli, and also 1,700 micromolar citrate, which is historical kind of. It's, it's, uh, it actually was put in there initially because it increased the effectiveness of the antibiotics that the researchers were, were developing at the time. Uh, but it was found that it also acts as an iron chelator. It helps E. coli take up iron from the media. Um, and so the, the paradigm, the experimental paradigm is super simple. You just initially initiate a clonal uh, culture, allow it to grow overnight, and then the next day, you pipe, uh, do a 1 to uh, 100 dilution into a new culture. You do this every day, ad infinitum. Um, and this is, this, is, this is what they did. It's been going about 30 years now, and they're at about 60,000 generations now. So they've learned a whole lot of stuff from this experiment. But one of the really interesting things that happened is uh, in one, you probably can't see here, but one of, the, one of these populations is not like the other. In, in this picture, one of the populations, you can maybe see here, is much denser than the other ones. It has a lot more growth. And this occurred at about 33,000 generations where the cells would be able to reach an OD600 value of about 0.05 for the first 33,000 generations. And then at 33,000 generations, suddenly they're able to produce about five times as many cells in any given culture. And actually, at the time that this happened, Rich Lenski thought it was contamination. And so he kept going back. You know, they keep frozen stocks of these experiments so they can go back in time. He kept going back, and it kept happening. It's like, what's going on here? This is before like, genome sequencing, so it could just sequence it and find out. Um, and then eventually they realized this is legit, and this, this organism, after 33,000 generations, had actually evolved a new phenotype. And so, you know, after much work, they found out that what it had actually evolved to do was to metabolize the citrate that's in the media. Citrate's not normally something that the strain of bacteria can metabolize. But after 33,000 generations, and actually multiple steps of potentiating mutations that got them to the point where they could get the final mutation that enabled this phenotype, it finally got it. So they published countless nature and science papers on this because it's crazy, right? So it's like really crazy to be able to just evolve this new phenotype where you can just uh, metabolize a, a, a something you couldn't before. So uh, anyway, that's that's the kind of thing you can learn with experimental evolution. Um, let's see. So other other things uh, that you might have learned. Uh, biodiversity is something that that you know evolutionary biologists and ecologists find really curious because. How is it that all this enormous diversity is maintained on Earth? You, you, you would, you know, it, it requires a lot of complex mechanisms to create this biodiversity, and you think that, that, that it might not be the case. So one system that was engineered by Ben Kerr, this is an older version of, this is like the initial paper with their follow-ups, was this rock, paper, scissors um, 
uh, uh, situation where basically um, they engineered a non-transitive relationship uh, in E. coli. So a non-transitive relationship is, is, is a relationship between actors where there's no clear hierarchy. And rock, paper, scissors would be an example of this, right? Rock beats scissors, scissors beats paper, paper beats rock. There's no hierarchy. Just one is better than the other. And, and you can create sort of a uh, complicated uh, relationship. You can create a complicated ecology based on relationships like that because there's no clear hierarchy. So the, the system that they evolved, or that they engineered uh, involved colicin production. So colicin uh, is an antibacterial. And so they, they, they created a strain which produces colicin, the, the producer strain P, a uh, strain which is sensitive to colicin, and then a strain which is resistant to colicin, R. And this is a rock, paper, scissors environment uh, situation because the producer strain uh, kills the sensitive strain. The sensitive strain is better than the resistant strain because it has a faster growth rate, and the resistant strain uh, has an advantage over the producer because the colicin doesn't matter. So it too has a faster growth rate and is resistant to the colicin that's produced. So there's sort of a rock, paper, scissors situation here. How, and, and the question they were interested in asking is, how can this be maintained uh, over evolutionary time rather than just collapsing on itself and having like one strain kind of take over? And so they did three different, uh, different sort of ways of looking at this. Uh, they put it in a mixed flask. So this is just any time you grow a, a shade and culture overnight, that's, it's an environment like that. Um, and you can see that, the, 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 and this is the um, abundance of each strain. So you can see that like immediately it goes to a single strain, right? The system collapses immediately on itself. Um, they also tried a different environment where it was what they call a mixed plate environment. So, you know, uh, old school, like, um, replica plating, what they would do is, you know, you take a plate and you take, like, this velvet screen, you stamp it onto the uh, plate and then you stamp it onto a new plate. And so in the mixed plate, what they would do is they would, like, stamp it and then stamp it on a new one, but turn it to, to sort of lose some of the geographical... Uh, information about where each of these strains was was on the plate. And in that situation as well, where, where you're sort of getting like a moderate amount of mixing of the, of the strains, you also pretty quickly lose um, diversity, but not immediately, right? It's a little less, a little bit longer. However, if you take a static plate, so like on, on, this is a plate here where we've got like spots in each of these different strains, take a, and you, you maintain the placement of each strain so that they get to co uh, positively assort. They get to, the strains just get to hang out with, with related individuals. They don't have to compete directly all the time with um, strains that could possibly have a selective advantage against them. When you do this, biodiversity is maintained over evolutionary time. So rather than one strain taking over, what you get is you kind of get the strains chasing each other across the plates. So, so at the interface of a colicin producing and a colicin sensitive strain, you're going to see it, it kind of invade that space, while the um, resistant strain will kind of start to invade the colicin producing space. And so they just chase each other around the plate. So what this is showing is it's a simple laboratory um, demonstration of how structure, like, like physical environmental structure, promotes the maintenance of complex ecological, or simple as it were, ecological uh, relationships between organisms. That's been great. They also did a follow-up of this, of, of this uh, showing, showing that not only can it promote biodiversity, but can, it can actually promote cooperation. So like maybe 10 years later, they published a thing showing that, that when you do it slightly differently and you have a, a mixed environment where there's like a 96 wall plate and they can do like moderate migration throughout the plate, that you get the evolution of restraint such that uh, cells will not evolve the maximal growth rate because by doing so, they destabilize the system and cause extinction to happen. Um, so, uh, next topic I'm going to talk about is symbiosis. So, this is actually some really recent work. Now, you've probably seen a number of papers that have been published. Um, just, how many out of time? I'm good? Okay. You've probably seen a number of papers that have been published where, where people create these sort of uh, codependent situations where you have two strains of back, uh, bacteria or yeast or whatever, and one, you know, one produces an amino acid that the other is oxytrophic for, and the other produces an amino acid that the other is oxytrophic for, right? But most of these systems really don't work very well, um, and you get, they're unstable. They fall apart almost immediately. And the, the innovation that, um, that this group came up with is they, they uh, not only created the, the, like, the oxytrophies, but they overproduced, so in this, so say this is producing the circular amino acid, 
this strain over, or sorry, this is this strain overproduces the circular amino acid that this strain needs, and this strain overproduces the triangular amino acid that the other strain needs. And what that essentially creates is a system of um, division of labor. So that only, you're specializing in a particular amino acid that you're creating. You're only creating the machinery that's required to create that. And the system as a whole is more efficient as a result. So this is even in mixed culture. They were able to find that, and these are different combinations of oxytrophies that they tested. And one here is the wild type fitness. So being above one means you're fitter than wild type, being below one means you're less fit than wild type, the wild type non-oxytrophic strain. And in each case, except this one where it's you know, about equal, the, the uh, cross-feeding interaction actually results in more fitness or greater fitness for both strains involved, which is weird. Like it's not actually, that's not actually really been observed until now. And all these engineered systems, they're super fragile and they don't work well. This is different. And in addition, to, so that was 2014 that they came out with that. And in addition to that, um, this this group in 2015 engineered cro uh, uh, intercell intercellular nanotubes by which E. coli can exchange metabolites. So I don't I didn't get into exactly how all this really works. I was just like, this is pretty cool. But they they're able to to connect to each other and, and share the contents of their of their cytoplasm. Um, and so to me, what why this is really cool. Is, is you, I mentioned positive assortment before, so positive assortment is where cooperating individuals in an ecology can recognize each other and only cooperate with each other, right? Like the, the problem with cooperation in ecology is that cheaters can come up in the system and they, they ruin the whole system. Well, this is a method for positive assortment, right? If you can recognize some, uh, somebody that's related to you and connect only to them and share resources only with them, that's a way that you can, you can only cooperate with other people who are other organisms that are willing to cooperate uh, and, and not have cheaters arise in the system quite as easily. So this is really cool. This is a group in Germany um, at a university I've, I've never heard of. They're doing really cool stuff. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little, bit about, a little bit about my work that I did in graduate school because it's related to this. It's why I'm interested in the topic. Um, so what I did in graduate school, I worked for Jeff Barrick at the University of Texas. And uh, I worked on the genetic code. So if you don't know, you probably do, but if you don't know, the genetic code is nearly universal across all living things. All living things use the same code to translate the information contained in DNA into amino acids, uh, 20 canonical amino acids to be specific. And there are, there are rare cases of natural genetic code expansion, but they are the exception to the rule. Mostly the genetic code is the same uh, across all organisms. So the question, the longstanding question about the genetic code is why is this? Is it, the same, is it the same across all of life because it evolved early in the evolution of life and kind of got frozen in time because now all organisms depend on it to, to produce their whole uh, array of proteins? Or is it, has it been optimized by evolution to be really an optimal way of creating all the machinery that the cell uses? So this is the question I was interested in approaching. Um, the technology that is used to do this is, is uh, genetic code expansion technology. It's been uh, developing over the last like 20 years or so, but it's only gotten really good in maybe like the last five years. There's like a handful of expanded genetic codes that really work well. And 3 iodotyrosine tyrosine is one of them, so this is just tyrosine with an iodide group on the side. And um, you, you incorporate it at the amber codon, which is a stop codon uh, in, in canonical genetic code. But in at least E. coli, we, we've been able to engineer it so that it's truly recoded to a non-canonical amino acid. Um, and so the, the paradigm of the experiment was, was basically I took T7 bacteriophage, I chose to evolve bacteriophage because phages use the host uh, genetic code, they use all the host translation machinery, and in this way I could hold the host static while I evolved the, the population, so I wouldn't get breakage of the system, of uh, the genetic code system, for example. And I evolved for 50 transfers in liquid media, I did 12 lines of T7 bacteriophage, um, and, and had a, a mutator strain and just a wild type strain. So I evolved this, and then I, I sort of did analysis of all the genotypes and phenotypes I got at the end, and basically the punchline is uh, that I was able to observe a beneficial mutation to this non-canonical amino acid in the native bacteriophage genes. So the gene that, that uh, this mutation was involved in is the holin. The holin is uh, the pro protein that's responsible for lysis timing. Lysis timing is a super important um, phenotype uh, for bacteriophage fitness. You want to lyse at exactly the right time to produce as many phages as you can, but also to not miss the opportunity to infect other hosts that are in the media. Um, so lysis timing tends to be optimized by evolution, and what I saw is that amino acid 39, a tyrosine, uh, uh, was mutated to this iota tyrosine in 53% of the population. 
This is significant because it's, it's in a high percentage of the population, and it's also a very rare mutation. C to G is the rarest mutation type, so you don't expect to observe it very often. So the fact that you're observing this at high frequency is, is significant. And so, so I basically I got reversion mutants from this ham, from this hammer codon back to uh, adjacent canonical amino acids, and these are just standard sequencing traces, and the colors are all screwed up, so it's hard to tell. But um, basically, in each case, the non-canonical amino acid um, was of a higher uh, incorporated at this position was of a higher fitness than uh, any of the canonical amino acids. So, so you know, unfortunately, so the question I was kind of interested in is like, is the genetic code optimal? This really doesn't answer that. It, and really what it tells you actually is our systems of genetic code expansion are good enough now that we're getting to the point where like you can actually use them for things in living organisms. But that was kind of the question I was interested in. Um, and so then one other thing uh, is, is, is this work um, related to speciation in, in organisms, in plants specifically. So um, you, might, you might be familiar with plants, you can, you can do this thing called grafting, where if you have a, a plant that's rooted in the ground, you can take a cutting off of another plant, and you can graft it onto that plant, and it'll just, depending on whether it's you know, closely related enough to do this, it'll just grow, and it'll uh, sort of become part of this other plant. So what this group did is they did this with two strains of tobacco, two, uh, not strains, two different species of tobacco um, that had different antibiotic resistance genes in them. So this is hybridomycin resistance and catamycin resistance. They grafted them together, and then they cross-sectioned the, the, where the graft, where they did the grafting, and they, Dual selected for both of these antibiotic resistances on plates then to get clones that are, were resistant to both antibiotics. And by doing this, they were actually able to isolate somatic cells. So look down here at, at, at the chromosomes. These two strains had 48 and 24 chromosomes respectively. They were able to isolate a horizontal genome transfer event where two cells, potentially two cells had merged or whatever, and created a single uh, cell that had 72 chromosomes and they were able to grow a new plant from this 72 chromosome cell. So again, with the colors, it's hard to tell, but here's the two uh, ancestors, and it's really like a perfect hybrid of the two. Like it's, it's, you know, it's a little taller than both of them, but like the color is way more similar to this, while, while like sort of the leaf phenotype is, is more similar to this. Um, so basically, uh, this, sort, this technique was, it, it, it was published in, what, 2014? And this suggests a, a potential method of speciation in, Wild, right? This could potentially happen in the wild and create new species. Um, and also, just like, just as a side note, it blows my mind that this is possible. Like, plants are so much, must, must be so much better at dosing their the, the amount of every gene that they produce than, than animals are because they just they, it's just like oh, 72 chromosomes, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll make a fully functioning organism that's about halfway between the two that you just combine together. <laughs> like you can't imagine that in animals. <laughs> um, so, so that was that was all the stuff I want to talk about. So, so there's a lot of other stuff you know that synthetic biology has been used to kind of study uh, ortholog analysis, where you take genes from say um, humans and put them in yeast and see if they still function. An amazing number of them still do. My roommate actually worked on that at UC. Uh, ancestral, ancestral sequence analysis, where you like try to build ancestral sequences from existing ones. Um, evolution of gene networks, which is kind of self-explanatory. And then uh, evolutionary contingency, which I think is, is slightly covered by the, the genetic code thing. But like, what I mean by that is like, in, in biological systems, when we observe something as being a particular way, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way, or could it have been different, right? So uh, one example uh, from, from another friend of mine at UT took a proofreading DNA polymerase and evolved it into a reverse transcriptase. In nature, there aren't any known proofreading reverse transcriptases. So it's actually a significant, an interesting question to ask. Is that because it's really hard to proofread when you're doing reverse transcription? Or is that just a historical contingency? And if evolution had proceeded differently, it could have been the case that there could be those. And so, so not only did he produce like a super cool piece of biotechnology that I use every single day, um, he kind of answered this question, yes, that's a possible thing that can happen. Um, and it's just an accident of evolution, or potentially something that was selected by evolution to be the case that uh, reverse transcriptases do not proofread like ever. So. Uh, that's me. Thanks for listening. Michael, uh, when you talk about um, optimization of genetic code, are you talking about the optimization of like the types of amino acids that go into the code, or about like which codons code for which amino acids, or both? Yeah, both. Um, you know, so 
there's a lot of evidence that the structure of the genetic code has, has been optimized. Uh, all, there's biosynthetic relationships between adjacent codons in terms of the, the amino acids, and there's also um, chemical relationships that chemically alike amino acids tend to be next to each other uh, mutationally. And then also the question is like, why do we have amino acids that we have? Um, that one is just so, so much harder to answer. Uh, but, and we really can't do it. When, when Jack Showstack was here a couple of weeks ago, I was like, can you get, can you like get on this whole making a minimal cell thing? Because I want to actually answer the question we can't do it right now. He's like, he's like, yeah, we've been trying. <laughs> so, uh, thanks. Where'd the clicker go? Oh, it's just in that little bag on the... Oh, here. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. speaking, but I've been here twice now, so that just means I really like you all. <laughs> so I also really like this topic, and I think it's really timely, um, also considering the March on Science, and Peter's talking last month about um, public perceptions of Symbio. Also, a quick note um, that pertains to the sign-in sheet. Um, if a DOI bio, uh, DOI bio and biohacking hub opened in Chicago, would you be interested in contributing to it? If you didn't know what that meant, um, hopefully you will know by the end of this talk. So come back and uh, voice your opinion on that if you weren't sure what that was about. Um, so community labs. Um, why am I interested in them in the first place? Um, so first of all, DOI bio, biohacking, community labs, these are all terms for basically people who do science who are not strictly scientists with a research background, um, basically in a very kind of MacGyvered way, um, a very um, kind of old science thing, but like alternative, not in the sense of alternative facts, but just in alternative science. Um, <laughs> real science. Um, and so I got interested in this doing iGEM um, because I met the GenSpace team, one of the biggest um, community labs in the US, um, at the iGEM Hammery, and I had the pleasure of talking to them and getting to know them a little bit. Um, and I met this guy, oh, there we go. I get, met this guy there. Um, his name is uh, Black Migliozzi, um, and he's actually a reporter at Bloomberg. Um, so he has no bio background uh, at all, and he was just telling me about the project, and he also gave part of the, um, uh, the GenSpace presentation and was talking about, like, ah, yes, this is how qPCR works, and I was very impressed that this team, who was like largely made of adults who did not have a, a research background, had known so much, and I was like, if uh, GenSpace has a better item, you, you do, clearly they are doing something right. Um, <laughs> and I'm also really interested in this space because um, two years ago I took a class called the Sociology of Science, therefore I'm clearly an expert, um, and that was sort of about, uh, we looked at lots of cases where uh, we were trying to demarcate between who is an expert in something and who is not an expert. And so to figure that out, we looked at who's in the middle, who's sort of a quasi-expert. And this is a like really a good case of that. So, I don't think point the laptop. Oh, I did. Yeah. Um, there we go. That works. So, um, community community labs are basically mostly started by, sort of nucleated by a couple people who have expertise. So for example, you have Ellen Jorgensen who started GenSpace. Um, she was from New York University. And there are a couple of people who have expertise who sort of nucleate and are mentors for these spaces. Some of them, some um, bio labs are also starting to grow out of um, sort of existing hacker spaces. So the folks who like to play with their you know, build robots in their spare time um, do woodworking, metalworking, all of that stuff. People who just like to build things are now adding building biology to that sort of maker space. 
Um, these are mainly nonprofits. Um, some of them charge membership fees, though. So if you want to go work in the lab um, and do your own project, you pay like $100 a month and you have access to this, uh, this equipment and these reagents. Um, and most of them offer classes, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so how do you build a lab from scratch outside of a university? Um, mainly with used equipment. If you go on eBay, you can actually find a good number of uh, used uh, thermocyclers, fairly cheap. Um, oh, what? Okay, I'm not very good at this. Um, and also labs, if you can't, if you work in a bio lab and you need something that your lab doesn't have, you can also collaborate with uh, local universities because most of these spaces are like in big cities, so there's a lot of um, a lot of colleges and universities that they can work with. Um, and there are also a lot of startups um, that you might have heard of, like uh, OpenPCR, Bento Lab, um, that uh, are developing low-cost solutions for this kind of hardware um, that make it more accessible to these sort of these sort of non-university uh, communities. So two of those solutions are, um, this is Ventilab on the left, uh, so which combines a uh, PCR machine, a centrifuge, and a gel electrophoresis kit um, uh, for about $800. I think they are trying to lower the cost a little bit. And then you have Amino Labs, which is uh, um, sort of more for like cell culture and transformation and stuff for about 400 So people are like trying to develop these uh, low cost options, and I think somebody else is giving a talk on this later, possibly. Yeah, Mike Vincent should talk about it some okay. point in the summer. So, more of that will happen later. Um, so, when everybody hears about this idea at first, every, uh, the thing that is on everyone's minds, and everyone who sort of freaks out about it is like, oh my god, are people engineering smallpox in their garage? And the answer <laughs> to that is overwhelmingly no, that's not happening. Um, so, there's a huge fear of bioterrorism, especially like. When this community got started, like about a decade ago, um, there was more of a fear of that, and there was also sort of this conflict between biohacking, like biohackers, and law enforcement. There was this interesting case in about 2004. Uh, there was this guy named Steve Kurtz, I think was his name, who was a bio artist. He was creating a piece about genetic um, genetic modification that he was using some like very harmless strain of bacteria, and this was in his house, and he. His wife got sick and he needed to call the police for something. So we called 911. And when they responded, um, they saw this stuff in his house and they were like, What is this? This looks dangerous. And they confiscated it and they charged him with bioterrorism, which is completely crazy. Um, he was working with something very harmless. Um, but since then, um, there has been more of a friendly relationship with law enforcement and sort of agencies that are regulating this. The FBI, which is also going to be another Demon stock. Um, has sort of developed more of like an outreach relationship with the biohacker community, um, and they've been more friendly. Um, this is Ed Yu on the right here, who is a special agent in um, the weapons of mass destruction part of the FBI, which is related to bioterrorism. That sounds scary. Um, but he's going to speak at Dean's. He is going to speak. Yeah. Oh, I thought the local guy was. I think both. That's, I think that is it. Oh, he's, he's local to Chicago. Chicago. Oh, okay, cool. Well, you'll hear from him later. Um, <laughs> awesome. Um, and so he's been very, I think this might be an idea actually, but he's been very instrumental in sort of like reaching out to the biohacking community. And the FBI has been at um, iGEM every year since 2009. So it's more of like a friendly relationship than like an iron fist, like these are your regulations, these are what you can and can't do. Um, pretty much every um, community lab in the US and in Europe is BSL-1. Nobody works on human cell lines. No one works on pathogens. This bioterrorism thing is sort of completely overblown. Um, they're all pretty much internally regulated, but um, they've also, in the US, uh, biolabs have sort of talked among each other and come up with a common code of ethics, which also includes not releasing anything modified into the environment, which going back to the glowing plant meant that um, people glowing plant were, or glowing plant were originally working in community lab spaces. And then they said, no, you can't sit with us anymore. Um, so, <laughs> because they were trying to sell people these uh, genetically modified seeds. Um, so everyone does lab safety tra training, of course. Um, the board for each lab like reviews people's projects. If you're an individual in the lab and you have a project you want to do, you say, um, this is what I'm doing. The organisms I'm using, these are the equipment. So it's pretty much like a normal lab. There's a lot of safety precautions in place. 
Um, so what are the benefits of all of this? What, what does useful science come out of these labs? And the answer, I think, is yes. So Isaac sent me this very interesting review article about um, saying that um, community bio labs are sort of partially an answer to this problem in academia where if you're a graduate student, you kind of have to pick a project very strategically and very safely because doing science means there's kind of, in sort of the funding and publishing cycle, it means it's, you have to do something that's kind of safe, that you know will work, that you know will get funded and you know will get published. And that makes it sort of hard to do something risky and something that you think might be really worthwhile but a little bit out there. You can only really do that if you're like George Church and you're really well established. But then the author for this paper says that community bio labs are sort of very removed from that because you don't need to, you don't like rely on that funding stream, you don't rely on um, sort of the publication cycle. So you can take lots of risks, you can do whatever you want. And I think Ellen Jorgensen <coughs> says this really well in her TED Lock talk. You don't have to make money from it, you don't have to cure cancer or even have it work, and it just has to be safe. Um, so basically, um, <laughs> basically, community bio labs are just the magic school bus. <laughs> <laughs> Take chances, make it safe, and get safe. Um, oh. So, um, a big, um, big users of community bio labs are actually artists. Um, I think the biggest uh, example, the most famous example, I think of bio art that I can think of is uh, Heather Dewey Hagboard's Stranger Visions. This might be a project you have heard of. Um, essentially. Um, she took sort of like random things on the street that she found like pieces of gum, cigarette butts, like pieces of hair out in public. Looked for like common markers of like physical traits like eye, eye color, uh, hair color, and sequenced those genes in these DNA samples she found just on the street. And then used a computer model to generate portraits um, of what you might, of the uh, generated portraits sort of speculative, speculatively from the DNA that she found in these samples. Um, which is, of course, kind of, of course, kind of nonsense. Like you're not really going to generate an accurate picture of someone's face from a couple of like, like a handful of blue guy on a piece of hair. But um, it's sort of more of a speculative thing. That, like this is something we could do in the future. Um, and the interesting thing is that Ellen, or no, Heather did all of this at GenSpace. Like she did the preparation for all of this work herself in GenSpace's lab, um, which is I think pretty unique. Um, and then there's uh, another example is. Not really a community lab space, but a space that's an example of like a bio lab that's specifically for artists. It's, in, it's called Symbiotica, which is in Australia. It's associated with the university, but again, it's a space specifically for non-scientists. Um, so interestingly, so what I was saying about um, community labs not being um, sort of reliant on publish, uh, publication is true, but there have actually been a couple of examples of uh, these labs actually publishing papers. Um, and this is a question I asked Beth Wolfenden at um, iGEM. She's the founder of Bento Lab. Um, and she gave me this example um, from, uh, I think, University College London did a collaboration with uh, London's uh, sort of hacker space, uh, London biohack space. And they looked at establishing Rosiobacter, um, sort of an ocean dwelling uh, bacteria for using, for use in like, cleaning up pollutants and uh, fire remediation in oceans. And some of the people work, who worked on this paper were members of the public. Um, I'm not sure if they're the authors cited here, but it was actually like a collaboration between members of the public and a university, which is pretty unique. And then on this top paper here, uh, Corey Tobin is the founder of um, The Lab, which is a great name. The Lab is the community bio lab in Los Angeles. Um, and he's listed on this paper um, and his author affiliation is listed as the lab, so I'm assuming that, um, and he also put this on, <coughs> this is um, a publication that's listed on the lab's website. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, they're great at naming things. Um, so I'm assuming that he did that work in the lab. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then lots of, uh, lots of community labs have iGen teams as well, um, which is not publishing, but still disseminating the work and um, sort of getting it out there. Um, yeah, about three minutes. Okay, I'll go fast. So this is a map of a lot of community labs in the U.S. 
Um, this is a place that doesn't have a community lab. <laughs> that's weird. I don't know why that is. Um, that's part of the question is like, we should maybe uh, get this community started. Because there is like a very vibrant hacker community. It's just there's no biohackers. Um, so there's a couple of examples. I'm going to go really quickly and give some examples of some community labs and what they've been up to. Uh, Genspace is in New York. Um, it's got started in 2010. Um, aside from Heather Dewey Hagworth's work, um, something interesting that has come out of uh, Genspace is OpenTrons, the graduate student replacing, I mean, yeah, graduate student replacing, I mean, liquid handling robot. Um, and it's a personal um, pipetting machine. It costs about $3,000 now. And then OpenTrons has a version of it in their lab. Do you have one? I don't think so. Um, so that's really cool that this startup has gotten, it's uh, started up at Genspace and it's uh, it started prototyping there. Um, some classes that Genspace offers, I think, really um, captures very well the kind of um, uh, outreach you need to do to adults in that they sort of really capture stuff that people care about. Um, they have sort of an intro, intro class. They also have a class that's called What's in Your Food, where you sort of use uh, DNA bar barcoding and PCR to figure out is your goat cheese really made from goat's milk? Is this genetically modified food? Is this not? Um, so this is something that people care a lot about. And then also fermentation and home brewing. Another thing about adult route reach, if you just make booze, people like that. That's, <laughs> you, that's how you connect with grown-ups. Um, and then they're also doing some like uh, fungi biomaterial stuff. BioCurious is in uh, Silicon Valley. Um, they also got started in 2010. Um, interestingly, they do outreach to um, corporate people and companies not in biotech as like a team building kind of thing. So that's very Silicon Valley, I think. Um, some projects they've been working on are building a bioprinter. They've been working on um, uh, just building a fluorescence microscope from scratch. So a lot of bio labs also are like very into actually the, the hardware kind of stuff. And the Real Vegan Cheese pro uh, Project, which I will talk about in a second, which is also a collaboration with Counterculture Labs, which is in Oakland. Um, and they are working on the Real Vegan Cheese Program uh, Project, so they're trying to uh, purify caseins and like have yeast produce uh, milk proteins that they can then um, sort of culture into real cheese, which is not produced from animals, but is made from actual milk proteins, so Real Vegan Cheese. Um, they're also working on coming up with protocols for um, generating insulin, like a uh, generic solution. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we're wrapping up. Right now. We're done. Um, so Counterculture Labs has a virtual tour thing on their website that I can show you a lot, but I'm running out of time, so uh, I will do that. Uh, yes, so thank you for GMODs for letting me do this, and also thanks to Andrew Scarpelli, is a graduate at the Leonard Lab from a couple of years ago, who I talked to recently about this, because he has a lot of ideas about biohacking, and he gave me some useful ideas to put into the talk. All right, thank you.